All right. All right, my friends. Growing up, I want to tell you that I did not have the same amount of confidence that I do today. As a child, I want to tell you, make a small admission this morning, that, um, that I may have subscribed to the mantra that books are my friend. I, uh, I lacked a little bit of confidence, and, uh, but I'm, I'm thankful that that's not the place that I'm at right now, but I've always been a reader. I've always been <clears throat> a reader, and I still am today. I want to tell you that, that even, even today, I, I love to read, and when I'm on holidays, I have a rule that I will always read a book that has no application to real life whatsoever. It cannot have anything to do with uh, the Bible, it cannot have something in it that I can preach. It has to be pure escapism, all right, while I'm on holidays. And so uh, my, my currently my favorite series to read while I'm on holidays is the Jack Reacher novels. Anybody here know what those are? A couple people in the room. I love the Jack Reacher novels. Here's why. They're just gripping enough that when you finish a chapter, you want to keep going, right? But they're not gripping enough that when somebody dies, you're like emotionally upset about it. You're like, oh, okay, well, whatever. I love those books. I really enjoy them, but I need to be honest with you that they do not have the power to change your life. They do not have the power to change your life, but this book here is unlike any other. This book has supernatural, spiritual power in it that can change our lives. And the reason that it can change our lives is because it is the Word of God. Jesus said that His words are not just words. John chapter 6, verse 63 says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, Jesus is saying his words aren't just words. He's talking about supernatural power. He's talking about words that have the power to transform people, that have the power to transform society, and he says that they can do the impossible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says it like this, The word of God is living and active. The word of God is actually alive. Now, the word for living in Greek is zeo. It's where we get the word zoology or zoo from. The, the girl's name, Zoe, comes from the Greek word zeo. It means to live. These are not just words. They are alive. It also says that it's active. And the word for active is energos in Greek. And that's where we get our word energy from. It has energy. It has the power to change things. The Bible says this, that it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to even dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And what's he saying? He's saying that the word of God is like, like a, a, a scalpel in the hands of a skilled surgeon. It has the power to remove from our life what needs to be corrected. It's not a skill saw. It's not a chainsaw. It's a scalpel that can do fine work in our lives and exactly what we need. So here's the question. What do I need in my life? And what do you need in your life we all need change. There are things that if we're honest with ourselves, and I want to ask you to share what they are, but there are things in our life that we know need to change. There are things in our lives that we know, uh, maybe we've even tried to change them on our own, but so far we have not been successful. The Bible says that it can change things that you cannot change on your own. There's a pastor that lived about 100 years ago in the Chicago area. His name is D.L. Moody. And he said this, that the Bible was not given to increase your knowledge. The Bible was given to change our lives. And what I want to do this weekend, what I want to do today, is look at seven ways the Bible will change our lives. And I think that this is true, whether you are a follower of Jesus, or you're in a place today where you're asking questions. That if you were to learn the word of God, if you were to accept it, and you were to act on it, that the Bible could change your life in these seven ways. The first way that the Bible changes your life is that it recreates your life. You might want to write that one down. It recreates my life. What does that mean? It means when my life is falling apart, that it recreates my life. When my life is just, at the, I'm at the end of my rope and I, I don't know what to do, God gives me a fresh start. He lets me begin again. The Bible calls it being born again. It's that dramatic. We, we don't turn over a new leaf. We get a whole new life. We start over. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 18, he chose, us to give, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Notice this spiritual birth and salvation comes through the word of truth. Without the word of God, we couldn't be saved. 
Without the word of God, we wouldn't be headed for heaven. Now, let me clarify that statement for a moment. I'm not headed for heaven because I have this book in my possession. I'm not headed for heaven because I read this book or because it sits on the counter or on my bookshelf and collects dust. That is not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is that when we read this book, we understand what Christ did for us and that we have hope for a future assurance of salvation because of the blood of Jesus. But how do we know about the blood of Jesus? How do we know that God has a plan for our life, that God died on purpose for us? We wouldn't know any of that without his word. God is not silent. He has chosen to reveal himself because he wants us to know him. God knows everything about us, and he wants us to know him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, From a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Like It's this book that shows us the path to heaven. We spoke a couple weeks ago about how the Bible is often compared to a seed, and that when we seed our lives with the word of God, that it begins to take root in our heart and, and things begin to change. We bear healthy fruit in our lives. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 1.23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. In other words, eternal, things that do not fade away through the living and enduring word of God. Circle living and enduring. The word of God is not just words, it is a lie. It is the living and active word of God. And so as James says, we humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The Bible begins by changing our lives, by recreating our life, but that's not the only thing it does. The second thing that the Bible can do to change our life is that it eradicates our guilt. It eradicates our guilt. This is a big one. I don't have to have any guilt in my life. I don't have to walk around with regrets in my life, and I don't have to walk around with shame in my life. You know, there's so many people who walk around life carrying regret and shame and just these memories of the past that they wish they can get rid of, but they feel like they can't. Have you ever been there before? Right? Maybe it's because somebody has hurt you, and you're walking around with bitterness and resentment in your heart. Or maybe you've hurt somebody else and you know that you did something that you should not have done and you have this incredible sense of guilt and shame that you carry around with you. Look, God doesn't want you to be walking around in life carrying a bag of guilt. Did you know that God wants you to be free from guilt and that the Bible was actually given to us so that we could know that we are guilt free? I had a job working at a hotel and one of my jobs was to carry the baggage of all of the guests who arrived on buses to their room. You see, there were multiple stories, but there was no elevator. And because many of the guests were kind of of the older, more mature persuasion, many of them were not able to carry their bags up the stairs. And I, they are carrying around a lot of baggage, all right? It's very, very heavy. And so they would get off the bus and they would see that their bags are placed beside the bus and they would walk past their bag because they knew that it wasn't their job to pick it up and carry it. That was somebody else's job. Someone else does it. God wants to use the word to eradicate our guilt. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I heard a pastor say that this is the soap dish verse. I'm going to give you a bath, it says. I'm going to see all of that dirt and that grime and that things, those things in your life that, that shouldn't be there. I'm going to wipe it out. We're going to get rid of all of that guilt in your life. It's a cleansing and disinfecting verse. Yeah. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation. It doesn't say there is some condemnation. It doesn't say there is less condemnation. It says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, Pastor, do you mean that all of the things that I've done wrong in my life, God's not going to punish me for that? No. Why? Because Jesus has already taken on the punishment for that sin. Does that include the things that happen tomorrow? Yes. Now, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free pass, and we just decide to go on sinning because of that. But we need to understand that we don't need to carry the bags of guilt from the past and maybe even the future around with us. And this is such a guilt reliever when we understand this. This is a shame reducer. The Bible is given for one reason, to rid the guilt from our lives, to remind us of what God has already done for us, and we get to walk around in freedom because of that. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26 say, Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water, 
through the word. Circle that phrase, through the word. What's he saying? He's saying, when I take the word of God and I wash my mind with it, it, it washes my mind, it, it cleanses the dirt, the junk, the grime, the guilt, and the shame out of my life. It reminds me how I don't need to walk around with those bags carrying them, that, that actually Jesus has already done that for me, and it makes me spiritually sit, uh, clean so that I may feel that my guilt has been eradicated. John 15, 3, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You know, there's a cleansing power in the word of God that when we read it, we're reminded how the guilt has been removed by teaching us the truth. The third way that the Bible changes our lives is that it activates my faith. The Bible doesn't only recreate my life or eradicate our guilt, it activates our faith. And that is so important because it gives us confidence. You know what? One of the things that I've observed is that there are a number of people walking around today who are not very confident. I counted myself as one of them for many years of my life. There are many people who've walked around without courage, who are afraid to take risks, who are afraid to speak up or speak publicly. They're afraid of dying. There are all kinds of fears because they're not always filled with faith. But the good news is, is that faith is word activated. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing the message and the message from the word of Christ. If you've ever read in the Bible and all of a sudden it hits you and you've thought, or, or maybe you've been listening to somebody speak about the Bible or watching something on YouTube about the Bible and all of a sudden you think to yourself, I can do this. I can do this. Your faith has just been activated by the word of God. You know, um, if you've ever been in a service and your faith gets activated by the word of God, it's, it's going to help us illustrate for a moment the difference between a self-help book and the word of God. You know, I think that self-help books are great. And there are a lot of great self-help books that are filled with truth, that are filled with knowledge. But the difference between a self-help book and the word of God is the self-help book gives you information, whereas the word of God gives you the power to change, right? So there are so many books about, you know, developing better habits and not worrying and, and, and making budgets and, and living a healthier lifestyle. And those are all great, but it doesn't give you the power to change. Those books are not alive, but the power of God's word tells you what to do and has the power to do it. It increases your faith. You know, before we lived in the Sudbury area, we lived in the Ottawa Valley and I felt like God was laying something specific on my heart to address the, the bullying issue that existed in that area. Now, I know that bullying is something that kind of spreads above and beyond any particular localized area, but you need to understand that the county that we lived in had the highest rate of child poverty in the province. And so I believe that there was actually a, a, a greater correlation there that it stood out among, uh, above and beyond the issue, perhaps, as it goes beyond that community. And, and I, began to, I, I began to think about how God was asking me to deal with this issue. Because the thing is that there are psychologists and there are self-help books who talk about bullying, and they say, well, if you just stand up to the bully, they'll stop. Right? Because bullying, what is it? It's a manifestation of insecurity. Right? And that's absolutely true. But here's the issue. Bullies aren't picking on kids that are bigger and stronger and more athletic than they are, and more confident. Right? And so as we tell this kid who's 50 pounds lighter and a foot shorter and three years younger, just tell him to stop and he'll stop. Well, it might be true, but what is wrong? They're fearful. They don't have the power. They have the information, but they don't have the power to do anything about it. And so what I felt God lead me to do was to give the kids the tools to have that conversation so they felt empowered to do that and the fight never happened in the first place. You know, when we read the promises in the Bible where God says, if you do this, I will do this, this, and this, that can increase our expectation and it gives us confidence. I'm never going to forget one of the verses that really activated faith in my life. You see, I, I, I read the story of Joshua and Joshua was the successor to Moses. Moses has died and God says to Joshua, you're in charge now, cross the river, take the promised land. One problem, it's occupied by the enemy and when you arrive, they will try to kill you. And so there is a natural response of fear. And so what does God promise Joshua? He says, fear not, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And there have been moments in my life where I read that verse and I think, man, God is speaking directly to me right now. 
That is the promise of God over my life. And as I read that, my faith is activated and it gives me the courage and it gives me the confidence to step out and achieve enormous goals under his strength. The fourth thing that the Bible can do in our life is stimulate our growth. The Bible stimulates our spiritual growth. You know, there's a verse in Acts chapter 20. There's a man named Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. And, and he says this. He's, he's writing to the people in Ephesians. or he's, he's talking to them. He says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. You see, Paul is about to leave Ephesus. And he's saying, I'm going to leave. I'm never going to see you guys again. And, uh, and he says, I'm going to commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up. Circle that. That's stimulating growth. The word of God builds you up and stimulates your growth and give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. What does that mean? What does it mean to have an inheritance among all who are sanctified? Well, we know what an inheritance is, don't we? An inheritance is something that you receive rightly as being a part of a family. So let's just imagine for a second that you are a son or a daughter of Warren Buffett. And he writes a will, and he dies. What if you never, ever took the time to read the will? That would be called dumb. Because you would not be getting in, all that, getting in on all that was rightfully yours. You would not be benefiting from the blessings of the Warren Buffett family. You wouldn't be able to enjoy any of it because you just didn't know about it. Well, when you become a follower of Jesus... When you say yes to him, you're not just a follower. You put your life in his hand. You trust him for salvation. You're not just a believer. You're a belonger. And when you belong to God's family, yes, there are family responsibilities, just like any family, but there are also family privileges. And the Bible tells us that we receive an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, not just here on earth, but also eternally in heaven. And by the way, God is richer than Warren Buffett in every area. So what if you go through your entire life not knowing any of the power, any of the opportunities or the blessings or the benefits that are available to you as a child of God? What if you never took the time to get to know what they were? That would be called dumb. Because God says, I want to stimulate your growth and give you the inheritance that you have as my child that rightly belongs to you. We took a look at a verse last week, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. It says that all scripture is God breathed. That was Theon Neustos. And is useful for, notice that it says four things. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that, here's the purpose of the Bible, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The purpose of the Bible is to help you live out the purpose that God has placed on your life. God wants you to be thoroughly equipped and prepared for everything that you'll need in life. Like you have everything you need to take on life. And he says that the way that God gets you ready for life, the way that he gets you ready for his purpose is through the Bible. And the Bible does four things. He says it is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training. So let me explain that to you in a different way, all right? Teaching is God's way of uh, showing me the path to walk on. Rebuking, or, uh, rebuking is when God shows me how I've gotten off the path and I've fallen in the ditch. That's rebuking. Tr correcting is how do I get back on the path, the right one for my life. And training is how do I stay on the path now that I'm on the right one. That's what the four things are that the Bible says it is useful for. The word of God is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The fifth way that the Bible is uh, used to change our lives is that it illuminates my mind. How does this work? How does God turn the light on, right? Illuminate, it's this picture of lighting up a room. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, understanding your word brings light to the, ordinary, uh, brings light to the minds of ordinary people. God wants to light up our minds so that we have the truth of who he is. The truth of how to handle our next step or direction in our lives. The truth of how to handle the relational challenges and successes that we are experiencing. He wants to bring light to our lives. So the question is, how does he do that? How does God turn the light on in our lives? 
Well, some of you may have had the experience where you've opened up your Bible and you've thought to yourself, there's not much light coming out of this. Maybe you've tried to read your Bible and you thought, this is just so frustrating. I feel like that's not actually happening for me. Well, I want to tell you that if you were to go home and read your Bible this afternoon, it might happen that way. It might be that you open it and you're like, wow, God is speaking directly into my situation and telling me what the next step is for me to do. But that's not really how it happens most of the time. Most of the time, light dawns on us. And Psalm 119, 99 says, I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. It says, I have more insight than my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. We need to be reminded that when the Bible talks about meditation, it's not talking about meditation in terms of how the world sometimes views it, of of turning your mind off and just maybe inviting anything in. It's talking about soaking your mind in the Word of God. It's about soaking your mind with Scripture and thinking about it constantly as you go through life. And that's one of the reasons that we are doing memory verses through our series called The Book. Does anybody here remember the verse from last week? Colossians 3.16, right? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So many times this week, that's just been brought back to my mind, and we allow the Word of God to be meditated upon in our lives, and God will turn on that light. You know, when you soak your mind in the Word, He turns on the light. He gives us a different perspective, a different way. He gives us the opportunity to do something else. Psalm 119, 105 says that your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He turns on the lamp so that we can see what step needs to be taken, a light for our path. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're in a dark space and you're, you're trying to find the right path to be on and you just wish that your, your lamp, your flashlight, would cast a little bit more light than it's casting, right? Well, when this book was written, the way that people would have lit their paths is with a candle inside of a lamp, right? So it's a light to our paths, right? The, the Word of God is a lamp to our paths. Well, uh, we don't really do that anymore, do we? Like, we usually just use the app on our phone. And so a more modern translation of this would probably be the Word of God is an app to our feet, and that would be okay. All right? All right? Absolutely, that would be okay. What's he talking about? He's talking, how does this work? One of the most important lessons that we have to learn in life is that faith in God's w- uh, Word works in a practical, everyday way. It's like the flashlight that I'm holding on my phone. It casts a certain amount of light. And God is giving me enough light to see the next step. Not the whole path, but it requires faith to take a step moving forward. And the Word of God will illuminate the path, but just enough to take the next step. The sixth way that God changes my life with the Word is a big one. It elevates my mood. Elevates my mood. And some of you need a mood elevator. Because it appears that your spirit animal is Eeyore. All right? Have you ever met somebody like that? Where you're convinced that like, they're, they're somehow related to Eeyore. They're just grumpy. They're down in the dumps. And, and they're having a pity party. And they only want to be there uh, by themselves. You know, I want to tell you today that the Word of God will elevate your mood. And so when you get discouraged, you don't need a coffee break. You need a word break. Full confession, I have coffee and word breaks. I pair them together, all right? That helps. But the Word of God is meant to encourage us and elevate our mood. You say, how do you know that? Well, Romans 15, 4 says, everything that was written in the past, he's talking about the Bible, was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Circle four words in that verse. Everything. Encouragement. Scriptures. Hope. Everything in the Scriptures is for our encouragement and hope. Everything? Yes. Everything. Even the challenging portions of Scripture are ultimately meant to encourage our life in the right direction. The next time that you get discouraged, the next time that you feel like you're fatigued, you've run out of energy, you're, you're not your normal self, you've run out of pizzazz, why don't you come home and instead of, instead of turning on Netflix, you open up your Bible? I mean, you've been doing it your way, and how's that going so far? Why don't you try? What do you have to lose? Open up your Bible instead of turning on Netflix and listen to Dr. Luke instead of Dr. Phil. All right? Let's see if that doesn't help a little bit more. Why? Because God's Word has the power to change our lives. Television can tell us what to do, but it doesn't have the power to give you to do it. 
This book will elevate your mood. And I believe that's one of the reasons that we should be spending a quiet time, a little bit of time with God every day. You know, some people call it a quiet time. I don't care what you call it. It could be a devotional time. It could be a personal inspiration time. Uh, it, you can make up a name for it. That's fine. But it's a little time that you've carved out in your schedule. You've decided this is a priority because of all of the reasons that we've already talked about, that this is a priority, that we would spend time with God, that we would be quiet. We'd think about his word. We would read about his word. We would talk to him and just listen. There's an amazing verse in the message translation that says, you are my place of quiet retreat, and I wait for your word to renew me. The word of God is meant to renew you, and the word of God is meant to encourage you. One more way I want to share with you this morning, the word of God changes you by liberating your potential. And I believe that this is so important, because the only one that truly knows your full potential is God. You do not know your full potential. Your parents your siblings, your, your friends, your co-workers, your employers do not know your full potential or what you're capable of. The only one who truly knows that is God. And so I think that we have to spend some time in his word in order to get out of the boxes that some other people have tried to put us in. You know, we, right now we live in a society that we don't really live for the approval of God. We usually live for the expectation and the approval of others, don't we? Look, we worry about what other people will think. And I count myself in this category as well. It's not something I love about myself, but I, but I can see it happening. Look, honestly, the reason that we put things on social media is not so that like 30 years from now we can show our kids, here's how everything worked three decades ago, right? We put things on social media for the approval of others. And there is literally a dopamine rush when we see somebody click like and love on our photos. But here's the problem with that. There is not a single issue, there is not a single item in the world in which everyone will agree. And so if we're basing our identity and we're basing our value and who we are and our potential on the approval of other people, we will miss out on what God has for us. There will always be somebody else who disagrees. There will always be somebody who clicks dislike or the little angry face emoji. That's always going to happen. And if we bow our identities and, and, we, and we seek our approval and the approval of others, we will never be satisfied. You don't know the potential that you're capable of. You only use a small portion of your brain, of your intelligence. Only God knows your full greatness and the impact that your life will have. In order to be free and unlock that potential, you need to spend time in his word. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It will unlock you. It will liberate you. It will make you able to do things that you never thought you could possibly do. It will set you free. Let me summarize, guys. Would you like to have your life recreated after it fell apart? Guilt eradicated for everything that you've ever done wrong. Your faith activated so that you'll have more confidence and courage. Your growth stimula stimulated so that you'll become all that you were meant to be. Your mind illuminated so that you can make wise decisions. Your mood elevated so you're not down in the dumps and your potential liberated. Is anybody here interested in one or two of those things? I think that I am this morning. It's all right here. We have it in the book. And this is one of the reasons that we're doing this series. You're not going to have any of that done for you by television. You're not going to have any of that done for you by the internet or by friends or people in your life. The only way that you will have eradication and illumination and liberation and all of the shuns is by getting into this book. It's all in the Word. And so I want to give you one practical, three practical steps as we leave this place. And we're going to go here uh, a little bit in future weeks. But, but now we have a lot of information about how it is that the Bible can change our life if we do it. And so what does it look like to do it? So when you go home today, what can you begin to do in your life in order to experience all of these things? You've got to learn it. You've got to accept it. You've got to act on it. My friends, you have to learn the Word of God. You are not going to be able to do something you've never learned about. Jesus speaks to the, uh, to the Pharisees in the book of Mark, chapter 12, and he says... You know what your trouble is, guys? Your trouble is that you don't know the scriptures. 
You don't know what the Bible says. Follow me on this logic for a moment, guys. What your problem is, is not your problem. Your problem is always your response to the problem. That's why you can take two people who are sitting beside each other and they're going through exactly the same scenario and there are two different outcomes. One succeeds and one fails. Why? Because the problem is not the problem. The problem is always our response to the problem. Every problem is really an opportunity and it depends on how we respond to it. If we respond in a godly way that the word of God tells us to, it's an opportunity for growth, for prayer, to grow in trust with God, to develop in character. It's an opportunity to see God do a miracle. And we could give you dozens of examples of why the problem is not the problem. The problem is not the circumstance, it's our response. And I think one of the reasons that we don't see, uh, that is we don't know how to respond correctly to our problems. So we typically do the thing that is opposite of what we should do. Our human nature tells us to do what is opposite to how we should actually respond. For example, if someone were to try to hurt me, if somebody were to try to, uh, were to gossip or slander about me, my human response, my natural humanity says, respond in kind. But is that what I should do? Why not? Because it only elevates the situation. It doesn't bring any sort of resolution. And so when we make the problems, when we respond incorrectly, we make them worse. And that's why Jesus says, you guys, you know what the problem is? The problem is that you just don't know the scriptures. You have to learn it. And then the Bible tells you how to act in every situation. Second thing you need to do is accept it. That means that I accept the Bible as the authority in my life. And we talked a little bit about this uh, last week, that we accept the Bible as our authority, even when there are things that make us uncomfortable, even when there are things that we don't understand, even when there are things that, that are challenging or inconvenient, but we understand that the Word of God, Theonoustos, is the Word of God, and He is God, and I am not. Look, if I understood everything that God did, and why He did it, and how He does it, I would be God, but I'm not. There are going to be things that I don't understand. I'm not Him, and neither are you. Here's the thing, it's very arrogant. For us to say, especially as believers, if we say that God had a plan for our life and that he sent Jesus to die on our behalf, that Jesus took our sin on the cross and that he was resurrected, yet at the same time we say, God, up until, like, up until this last week, you've gotten everything right in the course of history. However, this particular situation that I am walking through this week, I've got a little bit more wisdom than you. Do you realize how arrogant that is? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is at work in you who believe. You've got to accept the word of God as his word to work in your life. So I learn it. I accept it as my authority. And the third thing that I do is I act on it. John chapter 13, verse 17, we'll end with this. It says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed since you know them. Oh, did I get that wrong? Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you write them down in your notebook. No? No? no not again. Okay. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You don't get blessed by the parts of the Bible that you know. You don't get blessed by the parts of the Bible that you write down. You get blessed by the parts of the Bible that you act on. When I do that, you know what happens? My life gets recreated, my guilt gets eradicated, my mood gets elevated, my faith gets activated, my spiritual growth gets stimulated, my potential is liberated. And all of these things happen when I learn it, I accept it, and I do it. Can we pray together? Father God, I ask that you would help us to make the word, your word, the authority of our life. And I understand that there are things that I don't always agree with, that I don't always like, that don't always make sense to me, and are not always convenient. God, I know that what you say is true, even if it's not very popular. Truth is truth, and it never changes. So I accept in my heart your word as your word, even when it doesn't make sense to my little mind. I'm going to believe that you know what you're talking about. And God, I not only want to accept the word and learn it, I want to do it. As I learn it and I do it, would you do these things that we spoke about this morning to 
recreate our lives? Uh, would, you, would you free people this morning from guilt that they've been carrying around and shame that they've been carrying? God, would you illuminate the path for people who are seeking this morning to, to answer the tough things in life and, and need direction for the next step, that, that need their mood to be elevated, Lord God, would you come in and do a miraculous work in that area? Understanding your word brings light to the minds of our ordinary people. Your word is, an amp, uh, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Would you just illuminate that path? Lord, encourage us as we wait for your word to renew our life. Father, all the stuff that has us stuck and hinders our progress, would you just unlock that potential, liberate our potential, set us free as we continue in your word. Father, seal your word in our hearts. Encourage us this week. I pray, Lord God, that as we take that step of faith and, and commit to just carving out time, to spending time in your word, that there would be stories of lives that have been transformed because your word is living and active. It's not just words. So, Father, we thank you that we can trust you to change our lives. Amen. As we take one minute to close here this, mo uh, this morning, I just want to look at our verse together for our memory verse. Let's take a look at it. It's on the next slide. Open my, uh, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Psalm 119, verse 18. Let's say it together. Where is it found? Psalm 119, What does it say? Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Where is it found? Psalm 119, Let's do it without the words on the screen. Oh, come on. Come on. We, they're on the screen still. Let's take them off the screen. Can we go back one slide? There we go. All right. Where is it? Psalm? What does it say? <laughs> you guys have a week to practice, okay? That was like B minus right there. All right. Awesome. All right, my friends. Enjoy some treats as you go today. Just a reminder that this is the second week of Alpha. And if you've been on the fence, you're going to want to get plugged in. Today is the day for you to do that and talk to me so you can find out what groups have a little bit of space left. And, uh, and don't forget to check out the nursery because it looks amazing in there, guys. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.